at one point, years and years ago, uh, the Longmont Police Department was kind of a, a faceless entity that lived in a fortress, and it didn't have a lot of connections with the community. At one time, we were at war with the media. We were at odds with a lot of other entities within the community, especially the Latino community. There had been an incident in this community back in 1980 uh, where a white police officer killed two Hispanic boys. Um, and that, and we had, a, in, in essence, our own Ferguson times five in terms of what, what this community went through. There was a tremendous amount of pain. And a lot of that pain had a lot to do with what and how this police department was operating within the community. When I was a kid, I, I heard a term from one of my one of my older friends one day, and it stuck with me forever. And he says, it's the Longmont Thug Squad. That's what they called the police department, the Longmont Thug Squad. It just kind of was something that all the kids went around and told each other, like, don't interact with the cops, don't interact with the cops. Conversations were very retributive and punitive in their orientation. The way we were going to make people, this community safe is by catching the bad persons, putting them in jail, and punishing them so that they couldn't do that anymore. Well, that's not how the criminal justice system works. It never worked that way. There's just not enough room to, to, for it to work that way. And in essence, justice was defined as a pound of flesh, um, an eye for an eye, relatively primitive ways of seeing justice. There's so many antiquated systems and the way that we're, we're dealing with things as a society. So we do have to start thinking of different ways. I like to describe Longmont as the center of the triangle between Denver, Fort Collins, and Boulder. It's right in the middle of it all. You're about 45 minutes away from everything, but at the same time, you feel like you're forever away from everything. I think living in Longmont's like living in a big, small town. It's got a lot of the small town identity and community, but it's big enough to have um, great resources and uh, abilities. I like a lot of things about Longmont, but mostly the community. You can pretty much walk everywhere. You can get from one side of town to the other pretty quickly. We have a bowling alley and a movie theater and that's about it. <laughs> Longmont is a really wonderful place to live and work. It's a city close to 100,000 people. It's a pretty diverse city. Um, we have about 30% of our city is Latino and Hispanic identifying. Yeah, Longmont's definitely changed. When I was a kid, I remember it was kind of a, it was always referred to as like the small farming community. Uh, we did a lot of produce growing here, so a lot of summertime farmers' fields, and then in the wintertime, the population would dwindle down. So it was kind of a, just a small, sleepy community. We never locked our doors. I tell people I never had a house key until I moved out. Um, 18 years old, senior in high school, didn't even have a house key because I'd come home late at night, my door would be unlocked. Uh, that was just the type of community Longmont was. And then kind of the tech boom happened and the population boom happened and it seemed like within about a decade uh, the town grew from 40,000 to 97,000 people and it's uh, with it has brought a lot of the other issues big cities have now where people are a little less uh, connected to their communities. They're, it's more just kind of uh, go home, unplug, and not really talk to their neighbors type stuff. So we've seen a lot more of that lately, but um, I still think and, and hold in my heart that Longmont's still the true Longmont it was when I was growing up. We, we knew that when we arrested or summoned somebody, <clears throat> that didn't necessarily solve any problem. In fact, now you hear the phrase, you can't arrest yourself out of these, these social and health issues. So we dealt with a lot of things, whether it was addiction, whether it was mental health, whether it was kids, uh, whether it was any, any kind of crime, um, we, we, we just came down with that kind of hammer and came down with that kind of, and that was the community's expectation. We are fairly certain in most cases that the criminal justice system doesn't really work, and especially with juveniles. Also, uh, they 
um, you know, they, they make bad decisions. Their, their, their brain is not fully developed and their decision centers are not fully developed. In a criminal justice world, everything is number based. The judge doesn't know your name, he knows a docket number. Uh, the, the people in the jail don't know your name, they know your jail jacket number. The police officer doesn't know your name, he knows a case number. So having worked in the criminal justice system for decades, I saw it as uh, very dysfunctional when we have a 50%, 60% recidivism rate of people who go to prison. Uh, 50 to 60% go back to prison within three years. So we're not really rehabilitating. We're not really transforming people. We're punishing them for something that they have done, oftentimes with extraordinarily long sentences. The United States has gotten to the point where we're incarcerating more people in this country than any other country in the world by magnitudes of five, six, seven times and with no consequent increase in public safety and with no effective um, remedial result or not changing behavior. We all know that there's a certain level of futility. There's a certain, there's a great failure rate in terms of recidivism. So we did this study. I had a research um, and development person who did a study on um, the people that we had arrested one year, we arrested like 235 or so people for felony breaking into cars, felony breaking into houses, and felony vandalism. And when we went back and looked at their history of, of 235 people, we found out that on average they had been arrested nine times prior to that year, and that they had 16 charges um, against them. And so I presented this information not only to our staff, but to our community. And to kind of say that, you know, none of us live our lives this way, at least I hope you don't, where you're gonna do something over and over and over again, and maybe on the 10th time it's gonna work. Normally, when after one or two times, we're gonna say, well, fool me once, um, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Well, we're up to 10 times here, folks, and so can we at least think about another alternative? There was a kind of a, um, a push within policing to move from the reactive kind of policing where you just go to calls for service and you react to what's, what's out there to a more proactive, preventative, personal way of doing policing. And the, uh, the kind of the title of that was called community policing. We did a lot of work in Longmont uh, to create um, partnerships within the community. We worked a lot on opening ourselves up, on becoming a more personable um, police department with the community, and so we worked a lot on partnerships. I go back to uh, a very, very good friend and, and uh, colleague of mine, Dr. Beverly Title, uh, who brought the um, concept of restorative justice to me. And just know at that time, too, that in my head, I wasn't necessarily looking for something, but I believed that there might be something else that we could do outside of the, um, the criminal justice, invoking the criminal justice system. And so I was kind of ready and prepared for anything. But when she brought it to my attention, I was, uh, I, I, I guess I'll say my eyebrows raised and it got my attention because it took into account, one of the main things for me was this people choosing accountability versus people being forced to be accountable or there was legislation that was gonna make people, try to make people accountable. I was also a big fan of giving the victims more of a voice in what was happening because the victim's voice there's no legal provision within the criminal justice system for a victim's voice to be heard. And I said, I, I want to explore this more. I want to see what the possibilities are. So my name is Summer Deaton, and my mom, Dr. Beverly Title, actually founded the Longmont Community Justice Partnership. Well, that came 25 years ago. <laughs> and um, she had left the school district when she turned 50 and wanted to dedicate the rest of her life to peacemaking. Both Mike Butler and Dr. Beverly Title are visionaries, and they saw a way of doing things differently in Longmont. Beverly initially as an educator, Mike from the perspective of public safety. And so it was really 
those two great minds coming together, those two very charismatic leaders coming together in Longmont that made restorative justice possible. So restorative justice is a huge umbrella term, and I think of it at its most core is, is bringing together victims and offenders um, when there's something that's been done, a harm that's been created, and trying to figure out a solution that can make that right to the biggest extent possible. Why does Longmont need restorative justice? Same reason everybody does. I think we all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes in life. And some people make mistakes that maybe it's their biggest mistake in their life. And they, they, they get into criminal trouble. And I don't think anybody deserves to be defined by the worst mistake they've ever made. Many government programs are designed in a way that says only the government can come up with a solution. I would rather convene and facilitate a group of community members who can say, here's what we believe the problem is and here's what we believe the solution is, um, than have the government from on high say, here's what the problem is and here's what the solution is. This is not a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. This is how healthy communities, I believe, are, 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 are made. My outlook on Longmont has changed a lot. Um, as a kid, it was always just, oh, it's my hometown. Everyone hates their hometown when they're a kid. <laughs> um, everyone just wants to get out. But once I started really getting involved with this and kind of slowly falling back in love with Longmont and just like, wow, like we actually have a lot of really cool people here who do a lot of really awesome things. And like we're in a way kind of pioneering this weird like restorative justice thing for at least our area and it's really incredible to see that and be able to look at people and personally understand like oh you're just a person you're not your decisions you're not any of that Restorative justice actually looks like a lot of different things at this point in Colorado and throughout the country. And so LCJP has a really unique model because we partner with police and that's a fairly uncommon application of restorative justice. We're also unique because we work with both youth and adult offenders. So what happens in our process is the police officer is called out on dis um, from dispatch. They, there's a call for service. When the officer makes contact with the victim and offender, the officer can use their discretion to offer restorative justice. So the things that they're looking for are, is the offender, or we call them the responsible person when they come to us, is the offender taking responsibility for their actions? The second criteria is, is the victim okay with the case not going to court, so not going the conventional criminal justice route. If those two criteria are met, those are sort of the baseline making a case eligible for restorative justice. Uh, well, I met Dan, if I can call you Dan. Absolutely. Uh, after I was involved with a, my aunt in a physical altercation and was looking at being arrested. She, she left out the part where she first met me by trying to turn herself in for something that wasn't reported yet. I was at the police department doing something totally unrelated, just happened to be in an area where this young lady came walking in and uh, looked fairly distraught and I asked her you know, if I could help her and she said she was here to turn herself in. Um, I said, okay, Automatic, automatically believing, okay, we get people that come in all the time to turn themselves in on arrest warrants. Okay, she has an arrest warrant. So I get her, get her driver's license, get her ID, go back to our records personnel. They run her name and say, no, she doesn't have any warrants. Okay, well, she'll be relieved and happy about that. So I went and told her, you don't have any warrants. And she said, no, I was in a fight. I want to turn myself in for this fight. So okay. So then I call our dispatch center and do we have any reports of a fight lately? And our dispatch says, no, no reports of a fight. Okay, now I'm thinking this lady's a little, just maybe a little off and she's seeing things that aren't quite there. So that officer writes up a report 
There is a pending criminal charge, so the people who come to us have not been charged criminally. There's no conviction. Initially, we only referred kids. We only referred uh, first-time offenders, and we only referred misdemeanors. So the cases were a little bit more lightweight on the front end. Then in the community group conference, or the circle, people often call it the circle, that brings together the two facilitators, the harmed and responsible parties, two volunteer community members, so we also train community representatives to participate, and the officer who referred the case, ideally. If the officer who referred the case doesn't want to participate, we will pull in a different officer. When we introduced restorative justice, we knew that we were introducing a practice that was different than arresting people and summonsing people. And initially our officers, many of our officers thought it was just a little bit touchy-feely and that this couldn't possibly work. We had a great year. I mean, there was a great track record in terms of what happened. And so over time, we kept track of that track record. Hundreds, thousands of people who went through restorative justice. Recidivism rates remaining the same, 10% or less. Victim satisfaction rates up in the mid-90s. And, and our officers not seeing these people again. LCJP, uh, became under the leadership of Kathleen. Um, statistics and numbers started coming out a lot more, and one of the things that blew us away was how low the recidivism rate is for this program. These are people that are still held accountable with community service, uh, with monetary fines, um, with doing projects that they don't, wouldn't normally do, they're volunteering. One of the most important pieces of data that we collect is victim satisfaction. And we have 100% victim satisfaction, victims saying that the offender, the responsible person, was held accountable for their actions. So that is one of my big tools that I go to with the skeptics and say, okay, well, if you look at the criminal justice system, it's like a black hole. It's incredibly easy to take one misstep and get sucked right in, and it's very, very hard, if not for some people impossible, to get back out of. Um, the restorative justice process, because we put a name to it and not just a number, um, that person goes into it feeling like they have more ownership of their own outcome than they do in the criminal justice world. I am just wondering, like, why me? Why my property? I was just like, where do I live? You know, it's just kind of, um, I felt violated. Within restorative justice and our circles, the opportunity for the victim to be heard and be there is something that's really powerful. And it's really powerful for the responsible party to actually hear those words of how that person in particular was affected, not just, oh, well, this affects a variety of people for these reasons and things like that. Like, that's kind of my job as a community member. But when you're there with someone, you're like, holy cow, like, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize I hurt you in that way specifically. It's really something that's very powerful. And a lot of harm parties end up also feeling more at ease at the end, and they understand the other side as well more, where because everyone gets the opportunity to speak and no one's interrupted and there's not really a place for argument or anything like that, um, it's really just an understanding moment where the victim can look at someone and say, wow, I didn't understand I hurt you that way, and the harmed party can look at that responsible party and say, wow, like, I didn't realize that you were going through these things in life or this is what affected your decisions. like." and there's just that opportunity for exchanging. And it's something that's really powerful and really cool to see in a moment with people. So one of my, you know, one of my kiddo's friends broke into our house and um, we, my husband had come home. And so that's actually how we sorted out what had happened because he had just started out the window. Um, and so then we were able to like walk through and you know, figure out kind of the backstory because there's almost always a backstory. This was a kid that, you know, I'd had in my home, right? Like he was a friend of, of my son's. Um, that he, he'd had a hard road. Do you know what I mean? Like his life was intense. So we decided through much conversation um, that the restorative justice process was the right way. I really wanted him to have an opportunity to make this right that wasn't going to turn his life in, an, you know, a really, um, 
even harder direction than he was sort of already headed down. So then we came together for the circle itself, and we, you know, we went through the process. We heard the story, we shared our point of view, we shared our concerns, we um, listened to um, this young man um, share back what he had heard. Um, we got to hear his strengths, some of the things that really, you know, he does well in this world, um, and then worked on an agreement, you know, worked on what could be done to repair this harm. I would say the biggest change in him was actually the way that he was relating with his parents. So you could see in the early stages kind of like, you know, this sort of body language and the parent like giving the what for, right? And then as that started to loosen up, you could see like where they were really hurting. You know, and then again, like that's how we tailored the, the contract in some ways to start to address that piece. But here's the thing I know for sure, is that any person who sits through a two and a half hour or more process like that and hears direct heart from heart from the people who were there, if they're ever gonna perpetrate something like this again, if they're ever gonna go down this kind of road again, they're gonna have some second thoughts. For me, it was, it was a pretty emotional event more so of like that reckoning of like here I am sitting in this actual seat as a victim and my community, like the amount of pride that I had that my community afforded me this opportunity. I just, I, I don't even know if I can put that into words. Um, it's priceless. And then if I combine that with the fact of being a mother of, a teen, of teenagers, like how do we have anything other than that? It's just what's, it's what's right. I think what we get caught up in in organizations and communities is that we can somehow demand accountability. That I can go over and hold your arm and hold you accountable. Somehow that, that can, that, that's gonna cause you to be accountable. Or we get caught up, as I just talked about, in trying to legislate accountability, that the more laws we pass or the more rules and regs that we have with an organization is somehow people are going to be more accountable. Or that we can even sometimes purchase accountability, um, that somehow we can put a carrot in front of somebody and hope that they're accountable. So the demanding legislating and purchasing of accountability doesn't work. What restorative justice does, and by the way, this is a volunteer process. Offenders have to volunteer to be involved, victims have to volunteer to be involved, but the offenders get this kind of opportunity to say, I did it, I'm responsible. I drove up to Amy's house, I located her, I introduced myself, she recognized me from being the officer at the police department, and I kind of told her, now I understand why we're talking. Um, she told me her side of the story was completely upfront. And one of the things I look at also is, does the suspected offender story match what the victim is telling me? Are they trying to minimize? Are they trying to leave things out because they don't want them to, themselves to look bad? And Amy didn't do any of that. Um, if anything, she was one of the more remorseful and honest people I dealt with in a long time. So I explained the restorative justice process to her as well, um, and she said, yeah, she would absolutely be on board with it. Um, so that those two elements is what I look for is both the victim has to be on board with it and okay with it and willing to participate, and so does the offender. Um, if either one of those pieces are missing, it's not going to happen and won't be successful. Um, so that's where we got Amy introduced to the program. What I didn't know when I first came to LCJP was how bringing people together in that circle that actually every person who comes to that circle will experience some sort of change, growth, or transformation. At, initially it might just look like the victim and offender the harm party and responsible person. They're going to be the ones who learn and grow. But the more that you do this work, you realize that it's almost impossible to come into that room and participate in that conversation and not experience some sort of change of perspective, 
growth, new way of seeing yourself and the world as a consequence. Behavior is an expression of a need, right? So when we define a person by their one behavior, their one need, we sort of eliminate our understanding of the holistic aspects of a person. Because that's what the criminal justice system so often does, right? We label somebody a vandal, a burglar, a thief, and that imprint stays with them because it limits their rights moving forward, I mean, or it leads to incarceration. The alternative with restorative justice is that we say we don't define a person by one choice. We look at why did they make that choice. My, my take on human nature is that no one gets it right. We hurt people, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. But there's a part of us is, that has this desire to be remorseful, this desire to want to make amends, this desire to want to level the playing field and kind of bring back that equilibrium. And, and it just doesn't come from a perspective of serving themselves. It comes from a perspective of, I can be a better person and I will be a better person and I can grow from this. I just think that's there in our human nature. Restorative practices and principles and justice gives someone that opportunity. And then we work on what's called a contract. Um, and the contract consists of uh, usually three to five or six items that um, they have to be something that's obtainable and documentable as far as we can't say, you know, just go do this we have to give it, you know, we have to quantify it, okay, if you're going to volunteer, how many hours, where is it going to be? Um, and it has to be relatable to what the crime was, what the incident was. Um, and it also has to be able to show that it's repairing a harm. Um, and Amy has as much of a say in what goes into her contract as I do, or the community does, anyone does. We really emphasize in restorative justice that one action, one decision doesn't have to define the person who caused harm. One of the ways that we do that is surface their strengths and talents and try to integrate those into the reparative contract. So after hearing the strengths, the whole group gets to brainstorm what is it that the person, the person taking responsibility, what can they do to try to repair the harm relationship? So there's a brainstorm. Everybody is asked to contribute ideas except for the facilitators. We collect as many ideas as possible and then we narrow those ideas down through a consensus process. And ultimately there's a contract that usually has three to five specific measurable actions that the responsible person will take. Those go into a contract with a deadline. As long as the responsible person completes the contract by their deadline, they won't have any criminal charge on their record and the case is closed. If they don't complete the contract or they reoffend during the contract duration, then the case is referred back to the referring officer and it goes through the conventional system. This is um, a painting titled Isolation. It was done by a 15-year-old girl who was referred to LCJP for shoplifting. And she did this piece as a self-reflection for her um, restorative contract for repair to self. So when she was caught and in the aftermath of the incident, she experienced a loss of trust amongst her family members um, and also with the friend that she was with at the time. And so she did this piece as an expression of the isolation that she felt as a result of her actions that would be then repaired um, through the restorative process. So this was almost like a closure piece for her to, for her to express how she had felt from her choice, but that she was going to be able to move on. That is something that I think is so unique to this process and to this restorative justice is that the offender doesn't just sit there and get pelted with all of these these things that are, they're going to have to do, but they get an equal say in it as well. Um, and they also get to come up with their own ideas. 
Um, so by the end of the night, we all signed the contract, and Amy's held to that contract. I feel like my process in restorative justice was a little bit unique because my family members actually decided not to participate after. So I went through the process kind of alone, um, which is where the community was huge for me. The community was able to fill in those gaps and help me with what I needed to do to right my wrong. And so I was able to hear others' point of view of why what I did was wrong, how it affects the community and what I should do. And I took a number of steps that I wouldn't have thought to do on my own. And one of the issues with my crime is that my children were present. And so having the community give options to heal my children as well was just huge. And it not only like helped the whole situation, but it made us way stronger as a family. And that was just, you can't even put a price on it. It was awesome. I actually had one conference that, that, uh, that I cried, but it, it, had a, it involved a kid and I had just had a heroin overdose of like a 17 year old um, in the Jack in the Box bathroom, like two, three days before this. And, I'm, and I'm, so I'm, I've got like kind of all that going at once and I'm like sitting there thinking like, you know, your parents are looking at you like you're the worst person in, in the world. And, and I just pulled this dead kid out of, a, out of a stall in Jack in the Box that died alone. And he's like, your age, sorry, I'm gonna see, I can almost get like, caught up in it right now and I'm like and so you, you almost wish you could like take mom and dad and be like dude yeah yeah your kid screwed up but whoa yeah. your your kid is not you know doing this 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 type of behavior so you know kind of ease up a little bit but something magical and that Beverly always used that term something magical begins to happen inside of people when they go down that route, even though they may not be in that moment of wanting to take 100% accountability, often they get to that point through the restorative justice process. So the restorative justice process creates a place that I will say is safe and, and there are people are encouraged to become accountable, become that person that they want to be and to let that remorse surface in a way that not only helps them but also helps the victim and connects them more with the victim and connects them more, interestingly enough, with our community. I mean, I would have lost everything. I would have lost my kids, my career as a doctor, my housing. I live in a crime-free housing unit, so a felony would not be okay. So it's really amazing that I had that umbrella over me. At one point, we had 5,000 Part 1 crimes. When we had 65,000 people, we had 5,000 Part 1 crimes. Now we have close to 100,000 people, and we have less than 3,000. At one point, we had 450 gang members. Now we have less than 50. At one point, we were, we were trying to deal with one to three. And in 1999 or 2000, we had five women die from domestic violence in this community. Over the last 20 years almost, we've had two. Still two too many. And it has the advantage of working. Yeah, you know, we put a billion dollars into the Department of Corrections, a billion dollars, and we have 20,000 people in the Department of Corrections. We have, you know, probably 10,000 people out there on parole and maybe 100,000, 80,000 on probation in the state, and all of that costs money. Those systems are very, very expensive. And uh, restorative justice, you know, you have a victim offender dialogue, and you have a facilitator who may be a volunteer working for a nonprofit organization, and they reach a reconciliation, and then they monitor the uh, fulfillment of the requirements of the agreement. Well, I'm really encouraged to say that in the six years that I've been working at LCJP, I've really noticed a drastic increase in the awareness about restorative justice in this community. So I often experience um, at a local business, at a store, or um, you know, a, a teacher, or maybe someone at like a hair salon, um, 
people more and more know somebody, a friend or a family member who's gone through our program or has heard something about it. So it's becoming less and less common that I meet people who have never heard of restorative justice at all. It's showing up in the media more too now. There's more TV shows that reference restorative justice. So there's this culture, I think, in Longmont of um, cooperation and um, if something is seen working well, there's this um, ability for it to catch on and get into other organizations and other situations. So rather than it just being about criminal justice, I would say the future um, of spreading is more that restorative justice finds its way into other processes, other situations um, beyond the schools, um, and, and more of even um, how, how can some of those practices just be used in my interactions with my family, with my friends, with other groups I work with. Ideally what I would like to see is that um, every police department has the opportunity to use and make referrals to restorative justice instead of charging someone if they feel like it's appropriate. Because that's, that is happening way less than I thought. And so that, that's what I think is a really good first step and I hope, that's, I hope that eventually happens, that every police officer can use restorative justice if they, if they think it's appropriate. Yeah, I think the, the future of restorative justice is, is very bright. I think it's gonna grow. Um, and it's when more people get exposed to knowing that there's options out there other than the criminal justice system, I'm not saying the criminal justice system isn't needed, it is. Um, there's, I deal with a lot of people that aren't appropriate for restorative justice. Um, but I think the more people that learn about it, the more people that see it, the more people that experience it, the more they're willing to participate. It may not manifest itself in its current form. You can use the principles of, you can use restorative principles and practices in a lot of ways. You can use them in your relationships. You can use them in, in schools as, as teachers work with parents. We're talking mostly about wayward behavior and crime here. But it, you can develop restorative communities. You can develop, you can design new conversations that are built on, and, 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 and infrastructure structures and mechanisms that are built on the principles of, uh, restorative principles and practices. You can build those things. We're building those. And, and so I'm starting to see pockets around the country where that's happening. And I'm reading about those more than I've ever read about those things. I am a huge advocate for restorative justice being implemented by an agency that's separate from government, separate from a criminal justice institution. And the reason for that is that restorative justice has to be guided by a different paradigm. It has to be informed by a different way of seeing the world. So you can't approach restorative justice within a paradigm that sees punitive responses as a solution, but just kind of add on restorative justice as a layer before you get to the punishment. It, the, the intention that you bring to restorative justice, the values with which you practice, and the integrity with which you practice are incredibly important because that is what defines it. That's what makes it different than the criminal justice system. So. For us in Longmont, being able to operate as an entity that's separate from police but works in partnership with police and courts means that we have the responsibility of upholding the authority of the restorative justice principles and values. I think we're just scratching the surface with the possibilities of restorative justice. Um, I'd like to see it as the first option for consideration by district attorneys. So I think Restorative justice is really important for where we find ourselves right now because we have really latched on to a system, through, through criminal justice especially, a system that promotes denial of responsibility and leans heavily on an adversarial response. So the only way to get resolved something is to first deny that I had any part in it 
and then to say, I have to get as far away from the person that hurt me or that I hurt um, because it's not safe to get any closer to them because it might be used against me, right? Like we live in this system of liability. Um, there's so much fear. I think what we see out in the world today, um, especially in this country, are leaders and systems, institutions that are trying to promote fear and hatred. Restorative justice, on the other hand, asks people to get closer. I believe we have a creator that binds us all and that we're all brothers and sisters on this planet. We sometimes use artificial boundaries as, as lines in a country or race or ethnicity or color as saying, I'm different than you, but in essence, I think we all have much more in common than we have what, what's different. There's questions out there about, um, you know, are people born with empathy or can they be taught empathy? I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think in my experience, what I have seen is I might f have this opinion before going through a conference or a, a restorative justice circle with someone that they don't think about others. And then I get to experience that, and I realize that they do. So I do think that it is innate, and we, we all have the ability to empathize. Sometimes we just have to literally be taught how to use that skill. And I think that that's the, one of the most valuable parts of restorative justice. The two greatest human technologies, I will always say, are apology and forgiveness. And I saw that there might be room for people saying, I'm sorry. And, and people saying, I forgive you for what you did. I think those are powerful, powerful forces that are in our midst that go a long way in terms of repairing relationship, in terms of people choosing accountability, and in terms of victims having a voice in terms of what's happening to them. And so, so there you have it.